I did. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome on this Sunday as we gather together to worship. I'm actually surprised there are people here given the cold and that deer hunting season. My gun has started. I want to highlight a few of the announcements that are in your bulletin. First of all, on the back is an order form for poinsettias. If you'd like to order a poinsettia that will be brought up here hopefully the week before Christmas and kept here through Christmas Eve, we invite you to fill this out and to turn it in in the offering plate or to, your, to the office by December 4th. We don't know the price yet. We're looking at a couple of spots where we can get them from. And so once we have that and we find the ones that will have the least expensive but still good quality, we'll let you know. As you open up your bulletin and look at the announcements, if you have a pen, I invite you to take your pen out and go down to December 24th at Christmas Eve candlelight and cross out 5.30 p.m. and put 6 p.m. After driving over to Cochrane for Winona, where I'd gone to pick up a couple of prescriptions for my husband on Thursday night and hitting a whiteout, and it took me much longer than normal, I decided that if we have those conditions on Christmas Eve, there's no way of getting to Cochrane in half an hour. So I asked on the street, was gracious enough to make that change. So it will be at 6 p.m. Also a reminder that Advent starts next Sunday, believe it or not. And so the Advent study at Hope that will be based on a book by Amy Jo Levine, looking at the Christmas readings in light of Advent, starts on Tuesday the 29th at 4 p.m. Any other announcements to be shared with the congregation? Then, as I welcome those of you who will be joining us later at home as you watch this on YouTube, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship by standing as able and joining in our responsive call to worship. May we worship like those before us, in awe of many wonders and signs done in the name of Jesus. Having all things in common, gathering in our own temple. Our opening hymn is number 421 in the black hymnal. We gather together. The melody is the familiar one, and if you need it for music, it is on the previous page, 420.
Amen. Not only of what we have done in the past week that we wish we hadn't, or what we didn't do that we wish we had, but also of the blessings and the places where God has been active in our life and in our world in ways that we may have seen at the time or only recognized now. Please join me in our prayer of reflection. Holy Spirit, we seek inspiration from the early church to be truly together as the family of God. Help us to seek out the ways we are alike in our desire to be faithful to you all we do. May this time of worship remind us to live as if your realm is already among us. We all have a genuine place of belonging and are valued for who we are rather than what we have. May our time together be a celebration of the real presence of Jesus among us and the resurrection power of the church still in the world. Amen. Hear the good news. God's love for us is constant and ever-present. We are already forgiven and we are already blessed. Please join me in our response, hymn number 419, stanza 2 of Now We Thank All Our God.
sure if a congregation is a clapper or not. <laughs> thought about using an analogy about hunting with them, then I realized I'm a girl from the suburbs, so they probably know more about hunting than me. <laughs> we close out our series on stewardship this morning with a reading from Acts. It's from early in Acts. It comes immediately after the day of Pentecost. For those of you who need the reminder, and for those of us who forget things easily like myself, Pentecost was the day when the disciples of Jesus, who had been waiting for 40 days since Jesus' resurrection to find out what they were to do next, they were waiting for God's Spirit to come and tell them, that they were pushed out of the room where they were staying as if they had been pushed by a hurricane, and it was as if they had flames, touching their heads. And they drew this big crowd as they each spoke in the native tongues of this very diverse crowd. It was Pentecost as a holiday in the Jewish year also. And so many Jews from throughout the world had gathered there. And so Peter speaks, and many are baptized that day. Let us listen for God's voice speaking through these words. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praying God, praising God and having the goodwill of all people. And day by day, the Lord added to those who were being saved. May God add a blessing of understanding to our hearing of these words. meditations of all our hearts and spirits. Be inspired by your Holy Spirit and thus be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I have yet to find a church that doesn't enjoy a good potluck. And what's not to enjoy about it? Tables full of food, conversations around and that question we all hope that will be asked, surely you want to bring something home? And of course, every good potluck has a few essentials. Foods that must be there as if they were demanded. The essential dish I found, though, varies on the region. When I was in Massachusetts, it was macaroni and cheese or brown bread with beans. In Maine, it was chili with, I'm afraid to say, elbow noodles in it, <laughs> or a hearty soup in the winter. Florida's potlucks wouldn't be complete without some key lime pie, and usually a variety. There is no one recipe or pie that really is key lime in Florida, I found out. And of course, here in Wisconsin, I was introduced to fruit salad with Cool Whip and little marshmallows in it. <laughs> Never knew I could enjoy fruit salad so much. And also German potato salad. Yet despite all these differences, they all had one thing in common. I have yet to be at a potluck where they've run completely out of food. Oh yes, Martha's famous fruit Jello mold might be gone before everybody gets through the line. There may be more salads than needed or desserts. But completely out of food, I have yet to see it happen. 
And maybe that's because most people won't show up without adding something. It doesn't matter if they're reassured that they're there as a guest and their presence is all that is needed, or that everybody understands that the circumstances or timing make it difficult for someone to bring something. Even at my busiest times and when I've been assured as a pastor, it took me the longest time not to bring something with me, at least a bag of chips or a bag of store-bought rolls. It certainly wasn't the biggest part of any meal, but it was something. The first faith community, as we hear about it in Acts, that the followers of Jesus formed, seems like one big potluck. Our short passage today shares that the thousands of people who came to believe on Pentecost devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to breaking of bread and prayers. Now to break bread had the same connotation as it does today, to sit down at a table and share a meal with someone. And so they were gathered together and they shared everything in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. They didn't share just the biggest pot luck that the world had seen. They shared everything. Everything. Now we may recoil hearing that as if we are touching a flame and trying to get away before we are burned. For it seems to appear in many stewardship campaigns, this verse, as part of that plea to balance the budget and urging the congregation to make those offerings with the same generous spirit of the first church. And we can get lost in the questions that that last verse raises about selling everything. And it has raised questions and objections throughout the centuries. What does this really mean, is asked. Is this advocating for some form of socialism or communism? This really couldn't have happened, did it? After all, it would have needed something the size of a football stadium just to sit down with 2,000 together to eat. And surely, it couldn't mean everything. That must be hyperbole. There must be a loophole. And there have been numerous answers proposed to those questions. It's been proper that since the community thought that Jesus would return soon in their lifetime, they could do this because they weren't planning ahead and there was no need in their beliefs to do so. One common one states that this is a description of a symbolically idolized portrait of communal life and never occurred, sort of like Jubilee in the Old Testament, where all the property was to revert to the previous owners and all debts wiped out every 50 years. If they did happen to sell everything, if that part is true, it isn't about us today. It was a unique call to them, he said. They alone as the first people. And then finally, there's the one that this is very nice to dream about everyone in the world sharing everything, but it's just not practical today. Any or all of these could be true. I know they help mitigate my own discomfort with this verse. Yet I'm hesitant to completely dismiss this passage as only some nice interlude in church history. Maybe when I read this passage, it's good for me to squirm, either metaphorically or bodily. For as professor and New Testament scholar Matt Skinner points out, our inherent discomfort with such passages is because a lot of us instinctively shape against those descriptions because we recognize that a lot, we have a lot to lose in these situations. Yet in our shaping against this description, I wonder if the key message about stewardship is missed. 
For his passage comes after those 3,000 people are baptized and begin to follow the ways of Jesus at Pentecost. It describes a community rooted in God's spirit that pushed the disciples out into the streets as if it were a hurricane. This community springs out of the spirit speaking through those disciples in ways that the diverse nationalities in the crowd can understand in their native tongue. So Skinner argues that this passage argues what the Holy Spirit can do. These verses do not lay down rules or specific structures for Christian living. Instead, they indicate that the life and the work of the Christian community can reflect, even if dimly, the reign of God that Jesus proclaimed while on earth and secure it through his death, resurrection, and exaltation. These verses harken back to chapter 4 in the Gospel of Luke. And that's not surprising as scholars believe that both books were written by the same hand. It harkens back to when Jesus preaches at his hometown synagogue. There he uses the scroll of Isaiah to declare that his presence there and in the world is there to bring good news to the poor, proclaim release to the captives, to free the oppressed, and recover sight to the blind. He is there to declare and to institute the year of God's good favor. And so this passage from Act declares that this group of followers says that God continues to do the same through their worship, through their words, and through their collective way of life. And so Skinner concludes, just because an assertion might be idolized or hyperbolic does not mean that it can be easily dismissed. Acts anchors humanity's deepest hopes for community justice, generosity, and meaning, specifically as a result of these people coming to embrace Christ as the means by which God institutes and exercises God's reign within creation. As a result, the ministry of God's reign that Jesus inaugurated during his life, death, and resurrection is not merely a thing of the past or a hope for future days. It continues, sometimes barely perceptible, in the corporate life of communities of faith, not a dispersed collection of individual churchgoers. This first community breaks down the labels upon each of them as they sell their, all their goods and give the proceeds for each other's need. But they also do that in times of worship, prayer, and fellowship. It doesn't matter if the person was poor or could only put in the equivalent of a few pennies or a bag of chips, or the person was wealthy and could buy everyone a prime rib dinner or donate the equivalent of millions of dollars. They all belong at the table, together, as one, the beloved children of God. And through this, they experience true community, a full communion, not the sacrament, but a joining with both God and with each other, one that God intends us all to live within. As Ronnie Allen states, Sharing all things in common is God's means of providing this community. This practice is not charity, but an expression of solidarity empowered by the Spirit. And so this passage reminds us that as important as a building may be, the walls and the budget are not the church. The budget and the building are the tools used by this community of people who come together through the Holy Spirit 
follow Jesus imperfectly and live out imperfectly their belief that God's reign is good, it is joyful, and it is abundant, and it is possible. Good church stewardship, then, goes far beyond having enough money to keep a church open or pay the pastor. Good church stewardship comes from the sharing of the elements that these first disciples did. Through prayer, learning, breaking bread that nourishes our bodies through fellowship, and through the sacrament that nourishes our spirit. Good church stewardship involves the care of the gifts that God has blessed us with. The gift of community, of faith, that the Spirit has gathered so that a congregation becomes an expression of God's solidarity with us and with all creation and not just the collection of individual churchgoers. At times, that can seem as impossible as selling all that you have and giving it to the community. This congregation has experienced the removal of a pastor, exasperated by the shutdown and isolation caused by the pandemic. Some of you have shared with me how they felt that this congregation sometimes feels more like that collection of individual churchgoers, rather than that community and faith home that they had come to love. It may surprise you that part of what I think will help you restore that sense of community, of home, of love, is good stewardship. Good stewardship of this congregation and of each other. Meaning you come together, you make the effort and come together when you can for prayer and worship and service. You come together just to have fun to hear more about each other's stories. You come together to not only learn from me, but from each other. For it will come through good stewardship, good stewardship of the grace that God offers us all. Grace offers it to those who were hurt by others' actions or words. And God offers the grace to recognize when one's own actions or words added to the pain. It will come through the grace to recognize that even if it wasn't handled perfectly, or it didn't result in what you felt should have happened, the decisions were made by people who had at their heart the good of this congregation as a whole. And I've already seen this budding among you. I, it started even before I arrived with all who cared for and worked for this congregation to provide for its needs during that time without a pastor and in that strange time of not meeting during the pandemic. It, they provided the things that Acts tells us that that first community needed. Teaching, prayer, worship. And so, that feeling of community comes from what this church has always done and what it has meant to the wider community. It will come from the people who have been touched by you over the decades, even in the midst of challenges such as when almost a century ago they lost to the church building through destruction. It will take time and it will take effort. At times it may even be painful, but it will come. For as always, the bringing together of a congregation happens through God's ever-present spirit of grace, love, and abundance. Those exemplars of the first Christian community and their practices didn't last long. Only a few verses later in Acts, we are told of a couple who sell their property, give only part of the proceeds to the church, which is not the problem, but lie that they have given all that they have. 
And there's no further mention in Acts of selling all that they have and holding the proceeds in common. Yet there are still stories of imperfect communities of faith coming together and attempting to live out the love of God embodied in Jesus then and now. For what we are asked to be good stewards of, in the end, isn't brick and wood, but the community of people who use it. God asks us, how will you care for what I am forming and bringing forth out of you? Of people who through their gathering of worship, expression of love for myself and for others, and for all God's children. That community, God says, that shows that Christ is still alive and active in the world. We are invited to come together through the Holy Spirit to follow Jesus imperfectly, for I have yet to meet anyone who does that perfectly, including myself especially. And then we live out together imperfectly the belief that God's reign is good, joyful, and full of abundance of everything that makes our lives whole and worth living. We celebrate that we believe such a life is possible. And so we are invited to bring what we can offer, a macaroni salad, some barbecue, or that bag of chips, and have faith that God will not only use that to bring about God's reign, but that it's this essential part of making a community of faith that shares that reign, that love, and that joy with the community and the world. And as I end this series on stewardship, that is the stewardship message I can enthusiastically embrace. Amen. I invite you as able to rise in body or spirit as we give thanks for all the gifts that God has given us in hymn number 425 for the fruit of all creation. Jesus did 
We offer our hearts, our hopes and dreams, our sorrows and our worries in prayer to God. And we do so as a community of faith, as we hold each other and support each other in whether it be a worry where we need support or a celebration that we can join in and make even larger. Are there any joys or concerns to be lifted up this morning by the congregation so that we can join you in them? Linda. Um, I'm not sure if everyone saw that, but Sharon Core passed away this week. So I don't know if everybody heard that Sharon Corb passed away earlier this week and her husband had a stroke yesterday. So we'll hold her family and him especially in prayers. Any others? Mary. I And for those who could not hear, uh, Mary shared with us that Cynthia West died. And so we will keep their family, her family also in prayer. Any others? Then let us be in the spirit of prayer together, first in silence and then in words. Gracious God, we enter this time of thanksgiving with joy as well as gratitude. For we know that you long to provide us with all that we need, and not just food or material things. You lead us to ways of forming community that express and embody the love, the healing, and the welcome seen through Jesus. And you do this all so we can live as you intended, in communion with you and with each other, in relationships of welcome and acceptance, love and grace, joy and abundance. We know we fail too often to live this out. Yet we also have faith that is not through our perfect efforts, but through your perfect love and faithfulness that one day we will all be joined with you and with each other in love, grace, and joy. There will come a day because of you that we will live out who we really are. Each and every person on earth, children in your family. And so we thank you, God, for this and for so much more. Even though this is a season of thanksgiving, we know that not all are able to live at this moment in joy and abundance. And so we lift up just a few of these that we hold on our hearts. Violence seems to dominate the news again, oh God. In Virginia, Idaho, last night in Colorado, as well as across the world, in places like the Ukraine, just to name a few. Threats of violence arising against synagogues, such as the ones in New York and elsewhere. We ask that you hold the victims and their loved ones in care and in healing. And hold us to the commitment to your ways of peace that go beyond a lack of violence to a freedom from hate for what one believes, who one loves, what one looks like, where they are from. Help us to recognize each other as a sibling in you and live in harmony as your family. We 
We remember those who are victims of natural disasters and ask that you prod us not only to remember them after they fade from the headlines, but to also to continue to reach out with the assistance that they need. Where we have added to the intensity or frequency of those disasters, open our eyes to our harmful actions and show us a different way. As deer hunting season is underway here, remind all hunters of the care they must take, the power of the weapons in their hands, and the potential cost to themselves or others if they use them foolishly, so that each hunter, themselves and others, may return home safe. And in this time of thanksgiving, we give thanks for the life of Sharon Cobb and of Cynthia West. And we ask that you hold their families and their friends and loved ones in your care as they grieve the passing of these two women. May they know the comfort that you can bring that holds them safe until they are able to venture out and see those sparks of joy and hope again. And where we are to be, those ways of comfort and provision, nudge us to go. And we lift up all those who are hurting or injured in body, mind, or spirit, especially Sharon's husband, as he's had a stroke on top of his grief. Surround all of them with strength and with your presence. And with people who through their skills and training are able to treat them, not only professionally, but with the compassion that each of them deserves as one of your beloved children. Holy One, we lift up all these prayers as well as the unspoken ones of our hearts and spirits. In the name of Jesus, using the words he taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of you forever. Amen. And despite the fact that I emphasized it wasn't just their money that the first disciples offered, they did offer their money. They made offerings of their money, of their food, of their lives for the support of the ministry of this new community, this body of Christ, that the Spirit was growing. So let us take out this morning our offering, offering to support the ministry of this congregation both inside and outside these walls, and also offerings of our love, time, and welcome just as the first disciples did.
join me in our prayer of dedication. We are grateful, O oh God, that all of us can be part of this community, that we can participate fully in this place and share what we have. We bring before you again our offerings, our time, and talents. We also bring our needs to be safe, our need to be fed physically and spiritually. Laying all these things before you, we ask a blessing on these gifts and on this community, that empowered by your living spirit, we might continue the work of the gospel as a model for us in the early church. Amen. Please join me in our closing hymn. Number 422, Come, O Thankful People, Come.
other church. Not this building. We be the church by praising God in all ways. Amen. May God bless you and keep you until we meet again.